Okay, so um, let's begin then. Um, so welcome to, uh, to the last part, part four, transformation. This is the part that um, everything we've done so far, we basically see how we bring all of this to conclusion. So this part is about transformation. So we started the course by introduction, just to set the scene and give uh, some sort of context to the, to the subject. Then we went into detail to talk about marketing, um, and then we did the same for innovation. Um, and now is the last part, transformation. This is about how do you actually go about transforming the business uh, into a customer-centric uh, organization. So some of the uh, material we, we will see here you've already been introduced to, like ASCCI, and then there will be some new material as well. Um, so this is basically how you can start to see how we practically um, take the concepts we've been talking about so far and actually implement them in a way uh, that you can help to transform organizations. <coughs> the, uh, the agenda I have for this, um, for this part um, starts with the, the vision and, uh, and the business goals. Transformation always begins with the vision. Um, transformation is not something tactical that you do for a month or a few months. Um, it's something that could take three years, five years to transform a business. And always begin <coughs> with the leadership, with the founder, with the CEO, to spell out the vision, why we need to transform, and what are the business goals. So I'm going to start the part by talking about um, the vision and the business goals. And then after that, I will um, talk about the transformation framework. You've already seen the transformation framework. We introduced that in part one, towards the end of part one, which is the AACCI. So we will talk more about AACCI in terms of how to implement it, and give you some real life examples in terms of um, case studies, um, how we implemented the various aspects of ASCCI. <coughs> um, the third section here, foundations, talks about um, PMO, project management office, talk about project management, talks about um, requirements capture, talks about all the fundamentals that must be in place for you to begin transformation. And then the last part is, uh, is to show you basically um, um, a model or a template to, 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 to show you how you put all the pieces uh, in the jigsaw. So that's, um, that's what we have for this afternoon. <coughs> this is the house of transformation. The model of a house is always a powerful one because um, it focuses on the attention that you have a solid foundation for you to build a house. <coughs> you have the concept of pillars upon which the house stands, and then you have the crown, the ceiling. So we use the same metaphor to talk about transformation. The foundations we have um, are made up of um, having the right governance, the uh, structure, culture, and communication. From our experience working in China, this is a problem, this is a challenge uh, in terms of having that right level of governance uh, and um, to have an organizational structure that is created to implement the vision. Culture is, uh, is always an interesting one and we'll talk more about culture. Obviously we talked about culture in the previous part and talked about how do you create the culture for innovation. Now we're going to talk about culture for transformation, <coughs> and then obviously communication. Uh, so that's our foundations. We then will look, we will examine the framework itself of how to go about the transformation. So we will look at um, alignment first in terms of whether the organization is aligned to the vision between the departments. Um, and then we look at um, agility in terms of whether the organization is agile enough, um, customer centricity, whether it's customer centric, whether you have enough collaboration, and whether you are using innovation as an enabler. And then the crown, if you like, is 
the business goals and objectives. So this is the methodology that we're using. And I'm, I'm going to begin with this part. I'm going to begin with the business goals because that's usually the beginning. So having clarity in terms of where you're going as an organization. And then uh, I'll cover the second and then I'll end with the foundation. <clears throat> I have two points of views in terms of transformation. One is a vision, um, strategic view, and one is more operational. So when I do the last section of this part, I'm going to talk, I'm going to show you the equivalent of this from an operational perspective. But for this section, I'm going to talk about it from a strategic point of view. So I always, when I try to solve problems, I try to solve problems in, in two ways, top down and bottom up. Top down gives you the advantage of seeing a big picture to understand what are the key areas that you need to take into account, into consideration. Um, and it's good because it gives you that kind of broad mind, big picture perspective, which you, need, which you do need, otherwise, otherwise you might... Um, miss something fundamental. <clears throat> and then the bottom up will, will talk about the operations in terms of how to actually go about it from an operation perspective. You need to have the ability to implement both points of views and, and that's why I'm, I'm doing it initially with a top down and then I will complement it with a bottom up. From a top down perspective, um, one of the challenges that we see in many um, organizations in China is that there is too much focus here on the financial and they don't take into account these other dimensions so uh, an example I gave yesterday is when you have an organization that is focusing on growing the business by 30 percent year on year and that's the only goal or KPI being given to people then obviously people are going to go out of their way to try to hit the target and if in the course of doing so, they compromise the brand values, then so be it. That isn't part of the KPIs. So that's why it's dangerous not to have uh, these other dimensions. So we need to always be conscious of the fact that we're not only hitting financial goals, but also at the same time, we have brand values that we need to adhere to. And also we care about the, the customer and, and the channels that we are using to communication. All of that together feeds into the vision and uh, <clears throat> and then within once that vision is um, is clear and communicated then you can go about the transformation uh, based on the right foundation as we will we'll talk about shortly the result of all of this will be the following you know you'll have a clear roadmap in terms of what you need to do typically a three to five years um, a common PL which all departments can uh, subscribe to, can buy into, can agree to, and can work towards, and, and a business plan in terms of how to actually execute it. So that's, that's the aim, that's what we're trying to do from that first part, which is to spell out the vision. <coughs> so if you don't have that holistic perspective on the vision, then you might be focused on one angle, which is the financial, and then compromise the brand values, as I mentioned. Um, and that's the reason why we make um, a big deal and um, the business plan obviously needs to be driven by the vision statement so the first thing you do before you even think about um, transformation is to consider who are we trying to target who are who's our um, you know target customers what are the brand values uh, that we want to protect and nurture how do we um, want to reach our customers, you know, what, what sort of channels, what sort of customer experience, uh, and of course the financial goal. So all of these go together. So the customer and the customer values and the company and its values, together we need to consider what we're doing from a, a customer perspective to be a true customer-centric organization. In terms of the brand, um, you will be surprised how many times we get engaged with an organizations and they have different point of views in terms of what the brand is all about. You would think something like the brand is consistent, but in many cases it isn't. So that needs to be at the heart of the vision of the, and, and the business plan. 
Um, so we do need to validate the, uh, the target market, uh, especially in a country like China, whereby the market is changing all the time. The, uh, the brand value, as I showed in the uh, marketing uh, part yesterday, you always need to take these three catalyst entities into account. The brand, the customer, the category which represents the offering, and where they meet as the strategic brand imperative. So this needs to be something that you live and breathe throughout the organization. This is an example. Uh, this is a real life example of uh, brand values uh, that we have uh, created for one of our clients in China. I introduced that client to you yesterday. This is Broadcast, or WO, uh, the women fashion brand. Um, and the brand value is uh, made up of uh, three levels. So you have the brand values right in the middle, um, which is about um, uh, acronym is DCC, DCCQI, design, community, culture, quality, and integrity. So these are the five key things that describes the new position of broadcast. The values of the brand are in the way it is designed, the cut, the design, um, the uh, community in terms of the type of customers that is um, talking to, uh, quality, not only in terms of how the dresses are being made, but also quality from a customer journey, quality in customer service, quality in all aspects of the organization. Uh, culture, this is not just about buying clothes, there's actually a cultural element into it, and integrity. Um, across these brand values, we have feeling in terms of uh, looking good, feeling good, that accompanies these brand values. And the overall top line statement is creating better living together. So that's the strap line, if you like, creating better living together, mapped to these five brand values and then supported by the feeling. This is an example. This is, um, this is a brand repositioning exercise that took a few months that began with customer insight, a qualitative customer insight, and then um, talking to the various stakeholders and departments, and, and finally came up with, the, uh, with these brand values. Um, some of these brand values are tangible. So something like um, quality is something which you can touch and feel. Same with design. Other values can be a little bit abstract, like um, community or culture um, or, or integrity. So, Brand value sometimes can be something which is uh, very um, tangible, some, sometimes non-tangible. But not, 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 nevertheless, it does capture the essence of the organization. What does the organization stand for? And where is the organization moving towards? And how to differentiate, uh, you know, broadcast, say, from JNBY or Dazzle or, uh, uh, or, or all the other fashion brands in China? So that's, this is uh, an example which I want to use to illustrate how you go through this building box. The channel uh, metric in terms of um, considering what channels we'll be using, this is also part of the business goals, part of the, of the vision, which defines how customers engage with us. Um, it, it basically outlines how the customer's experience and the journey going to be uh, you know, with the brand in terms of what channels they would use to talk to us and how they can switch from one to the other. And uh, the, the point here is the, that journey, as I've showed you in the visualization wheel, is all integrated, it's not disconnected. So it's not good to have, you know, 10 different channels if each one of them is completely disconnected. They all need to be working together. Um, so that's, uh, that's quite an important aspect in terms of the, uh, of the vision. So this is the uh, visualization wheel uh, that I showed. And uh, on the left-hand side, we have the, uh, the channels. And on the right-hand side, we have the steps. So when you launch um, a program, um, you know, such approach, you have a lot of things to consider. And uh, it could be a very big task. And it would be, it's good to have the vision, to have that kind of big picture. But it's critical not to start with, you know, uh, uh, 
to try to implement the whole thing in the first phase. So you need to go on an incremental basis. And if you're going to have an incremental basis, then you need to uh, ensure that your foundation is solid. In other words, when you start the first phase, um, the extensibility of that solution is key. So, because you need to be able to extend it one block at a time, one layer at a time. And hence, we need to ensure we have integration based on processes, to ensure that we have the right level of sharing, communication, and collaboration among all the stakeholders. Um, <coughs> integration in terms of systems, to have the right systems talking to each other in terms of interfaces. Um, integration in terms of the organization, the roles and responsibilities. What we mean by that is, when, when we are working, say, with merchandisers, we give them some KPIs relating to marketing, relating to supply chain, deliberately, so that they can actually understand how they need to collaborate with each other. If you take um, the task of, say, launching a new product, so you have a, a new product that you're about to launch, which departments will need to be involved in launching a new product out of the five departments I mentioned yesterday and today? This is the dangerous zone now when everyone is uh, feeling very heavy and sleepy. So, come on guys. You are launching a new product. Which department would be involved in the launch? Marketing is one. Merchandise. Delivery. Customer service, supply chain, everything. So, marketing is obvious because you need to make visibility that you're launching a new brand. Merchandise is, is obvious because you need obviously to sell it. Supply chain need to be alerted, you know, we're going to have a new product, so you might have an increase in load. Customer service needs to be prepared. IT needs to be prepared. So you have all departments need all to work together. So what do you need to achieve this? You need to have a common calendar that people all understand their roles into this. You need to have KPIs that um, help people to collaborate with, with each other, help to, to make people see uh, life from, from, each, from, you know, from the other department's perspective. Um, and, and, and hence, in a multi-channel world, in a customer-centric world, you need to think horizontal across departments and not vertical um, you know, to have a departmentalized views of the world. So this is key and the customer centricity is driving that change. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned a few times you, th you should think big and start small. One mechanism to do this, which we use quite frequently, is something called MMF. MMF stands for Minimal Marketable Features. MMF basically means I have this big vision to do this customer-centric um, offering, but I'm going to start on the absolute minimum that would be acceptable for the customers. The customers can see great value in it, and minimal that will be in line with my brand values. That's what MMF means. Um, so you start on a small basis and then gradually you increment. So for example, when you define an MMF um, definition, you need to specify what channels am I using when I first launch. So I know I have 10 channels, but I'm not going to use 10 channels from day one. So what will be the minimum channels that I'll be using? Um, what kind of range would I be launching? So if you are a department store and you're selling everything from fashion to kids' wear to um, homeware, uh, etc., do you, do you launch with all of them or do you launch with, with some of them? So which range would you focus on first? Which region would you focus on? That would determine what warehouses, what distribution centers you'd use. That would also impact your range in terms of um, the physical dimensions in China, the, uh, the, the, the color tone, the preferences. Um, and finally, features. So how rich do you go to the market with? How sophisticated is your offering? Um, this process is quite important. Typically, businesses want everything today. So they want to launch with full features, with full range, with full um, uh, you know, um, geographic coverage, etc. But um, transformation is, 
is, is a hard thing because you're asking people to change the way they do things. That by itself is incredibly difficult to achieve, let alone launching a new um, system and so on. So you need to make it easy for yourself to, to have the vision but to start on a small basis. And adopting an MMF approach would help you to achieve this. Um, so here we can see two pictures in terms of um, the use of channels. Picture one has uh, the colors aren't great, but you can see that um, on the left hand side you have um, T Mall, 38%, you have VIP, uh, 19%, you have um, the B2C is actually quite um, small in here. And on the right hand side you can see um, T Mall and VP, you, have, you can see B2C is massive, 40% compared to 6%. And then you have apps here, um, common between the two. When you look at these two pictures, what do you see? What's the difference between these two pictures? Apart from the obvious in terms of uh, the allocation, but overall, when you look at these two pictures, what strategy do you see on the left-hand side and what strategy do you see on the right-hand side? Think of the four aspects of the vision that I mentioned. Finance, customers, channel, brand. Yeah? Finance, customer, channel, brand. Look at the left-hand side. Which of these four things is the picture on the left-hand side focusing on? Sorry? Finance. Finance. Yeah, everyone sees that? That's the correct answer. Yeah. Here, we are focusing on making money. That's the focus. It's financial focus. What does the picture on the right-hand side focus on? Customers. Customers, brands, channels. So the, the, the right-hand side has a much more of a visionary outlook. The left-hand side is much more of a conservative based on what we've been doing all these years. <clears throat> so the left-hand side basically says, grow the revenue regardless. The right-hand side says, grow the revenue, but use it in such a way that you do protect the brand values, you do focus on the customers. And that's the massive difference uh, in terms of how a real-life customer looked at five years. So the left-hand side is what they've done, the right-hand side is what we've done. And then, and, then the, and then the fun started in terms of trying to bridge the gap between the left and right. Now, back to your question about, uh, you know, what is the approach here? When I say to the business, you need to grow by 30%, and if I manage Tmall, uh, separate from the actual uh, direct stores and, and, and so on. What the TMO team would need to do is they need to hit the target. And if hitting the target means they will order new fabrics and they will create new uh, range and they would discount it, including deep discount up to 60, 70, 80 percent, they would do all of that because they need to hit the revenue in order to achieve this, because it's not just Tmall, it's Tmall, it's VIP, it's uh, Jingdong, all of that is here. You need to think about who is using these channels. Typically, you know, those channels are used by price sensitive. So people who are interested in buying things cheaply, you know, will use these, will, will use these channels. So when you go online, when you, uh, and you, you search for a brand, and the first thing you see is uh, Tmall, because obviously the index is quite high, and you see ads to say 80% discount immediately, unless you are in the mass market and, and unless your brand is really cheap, you are cheapening the brand, you are compromising the brand. While in here, you are talking much more about protecting that kind of brand value. So, um, the, you know, there is no right or wrong answer, but here's my view, you know, to answer your question. Tmall is the channel that cannot be ignored. So I'm not saying forget Tmall, don't use Tmall. But Tmall should be used selectively. So for example, if I have end of lines, 
um, you know, I want to clear my, uh, uh, my products, then in that case, it's fine to use Tmall. Now, <laughs> Tmall themselves don't like that. Tmall wants you to, uh, to sell your latest collection. They don't want you to sell only your end of lines, and they will, you know, they will try to create pressure on you to do so. So it depends on how big the brand is and how badly they want it in terms of who's going to win. But that's the kind of situation. The, the challenge for you is if you sell everything on Tmall, why would people come to your B2C? Why would they come to the website? So hence, when we talk about the product strategy, um, you know, for me, I always recommend your uh, latest collections to be on your B2C. You don't sell that on, your, on, on Tmall. In fact, I might go even further and say certain items within your latest collection should be exclusively on the web. So not only, not even in direct stores you'll be selling these items. So certain colors, certain level of details, only on the website. You need to create um, differentiation in order to attract traffic. And um, what's, what I find interesting is when I first came to China five years ago, there was absolutely no interest in this. All the focus was we make lots of money on, on Timo, why would I consider anything else? But the real cost wasn't really apparent, but now it is. Because now um, retailers and brands begun to understand that to provide that kind of brand experience and to emphasize the brand heritage, they need to be able to do this. They need to be able to do this. This is where they're moving towards. You can't do this with Timo. Ability to switch channels like that. But if you care about customers, and you care about their convenience and their rich experience, you have no choice but to adapt, but, but to adopt this. And hence, you might take a decision that you don't only want to play it safe, you do want to venture. Now the challenge with the right-hand side is people fear what they don't know. So if you've never done this, uh, then you think, well, I know I'm safe with Tmall because Tmall generates lots of traffic, but if I'm doing it on my own, how can I succeed? How can I do it? Because there are a number of myths here playing up. Myth number one, people only buy from the internet if they are price sensitive. That's not true. And that is changing. That view is changing uh, you know, every day. And now there is a general re realization that people also buy based on convenience. People buy for other reasons, not just price. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing is there is also this misconception that to succeed, you have to do one of two things. Either you, um, uh, you drop your price or you pay a lot of money for ads. Both ideas are wrong as well because they're not thinking about the modern way of doing things. So yesterday I talked about Three steps, attraction, conversion, maximizing. If you don't think about the customer journey and you don't think about customer insight and you don't take all the steps to, um, to increase your ranking and search engine optimization and launch your mobile apps and build alliances and partnership and have uh, you know, uh, the um, uh, owned, paid, uh, owned, shared, uh, earned and, and paid, you don't have any of that for the attraction and you don't think about personalization and targeted promotions for the conversion, and you don't think about cross-sell and upsell for the merchandising, if you don't do all of that, is it a surprise that you can't win other than reducing the price or paying ads? So what I'm trying to say is, if you want to succeed in this world, there are a number of tasks that needs to be done. And if you don't do these tasks, then yes, of course, you have no choice but to reduce the price. But if you trade properly on the right-hand side, then you will be able to generate traffic. But you need, to, you need to, to make the decision that you want to do so. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Any other questions or points about this? This slide is very important because it does show you where people are at right now and where people need to be. Yes. Um, if I understand this correctly, are you saying that B two C or the uh, the forty percent bigger in the channel two that saying giving better protection to your brand image? Given what? Sorry. Better protection to your brand image. Yes. But we see that there's a lot of company actually only sell their product on the internet, 
and eventually build a very good image. I was just thinking of okay, this, uh, actually say this is the right hand is the new way to do the business. And uh, I want to see what's your comments on this. Right, so the reason why this protects your brand because there is more direct control on this compared to the left hand side. If your business, if you, if 90% of your revenue comes from say franchising or 90% of your revenue comes from third parties like Timo, in both examples you're not really in control. You are not directly doing retailing. You are effectively delegating trading to someone else. You're not doing it yourself. So unless you have a really rigorous and strong process and ability to manage your franchisees. You can't manage Timo. Timo is too big for you to manage. No one can manage Timo. You can manage franchisees maybe, but even franchisees, um, you know, because you, you need to be able to, um, franchises is your bloodline, is, is your lifeline. So in many cases, it's not, um, the, uh, the balance is tilting towards the franchisees. So much that I would say a big statement like, Merchandise departments in many fashion brands are actually only servicing franchisees. They are not proper merchandising departments that can stand on their own feet and actually, uh, you know, do trading as, as you'd expect in merchandising. So the slide, the picture on the right hand side is showing trading directly. The picture on the left hand side is showing trading through third parties. And, and that's the reason why the right hand side would protect your brand values more than the left hand side. Yes? Sorry, I, I'm not very clear about, you know, those two slides are the collaborations between two companies or... That's the same company. The same company? Yeah. The different way to count them. Yeah. This is the same company, the same time. done in different... No, no, it's, 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 it, this, is, this was an exercise that was done uh, at the same time by the company and, uh, and by us. So, you know, both were trying to show, right, okay, knowing everything we know, how do we see life in five years' time? Where do we see, uh, you know, how do we see the split of revenue in five years' time? And this was done in a very conservative way, in a very traditional way, and this was done in a, in a more visionary way. The left-hand side is focusing on finance. The right-hand side is focusing on finance and customers, you know. In terms of the, the actual uh, figure, it's the same. So in terms of turnover, it's the same. The only question is the distribution, the split. Another, another question is, you know, what's the difference between B2C in mobile and uh, on the right side and the APP? Difference between B2C including mobile, yeah. yeah. And APP. Uh, right, so the whole APP thing, um, and again, that was quite an interesting debate. Because um, you know, people who uh, created the left-hand side, they saw uh, the app role as linked to the store. We saw the app not linked to any store. We saw the app as uh, nationwide. They saw the app linked to the store. So let me reply to your question by asking you a question. Why do you think they focus the app to the store on the left-hand side? Maybe less effort. Less effort. Um, th there is a lot of franchising business going on here. And uh, if you uh, limit the uh, app to the store, what you're really saying on the left-hand side is, I'm going to give you the business, Mr. Franchising. While on the right-hand side, by not limiting the mobile app to the store, you are saying, you, the customer, can be free to choose whatever you want. On the left-hand side, we are telling the customer what channel to use. On the right-hand side, we are giving it free the choice to the customer. That's the difference. Oh, just to echo that question, could I say that if you have limited number of franchisees, so you just link the app to be a, be a physical franchisee, so in order to increase the business of this, you give the support to the uh, offline business. Would that be true? Um, my own view is apps should not be uh, bound, we should not force apps to only focus to the store. So that's, that's the start. So apps, you know, people should be free to choose whatever they want. That's number one. 
Number two, the reason why a lot of brands are nervous about this picture, because they think if they do this, the franchisees would abandon them, would not work with them, because they will view this as cannibalization. So for me, it's not a question of um, black and white. Uh, it's not a question of you know, uh, excluding the, the franchisees, uh, because franchi franchising obviously is a big business in China. So my, appro my approach, my view on this is uh, you should involve the franchising within your omnichannel, within your customer centric. And you should reward them if they engage in it. Because you want to get, the, you, you want something from the franchising. You want to have uh, SKU uh, visibility. You want to have customer data visibility. You want to have um, uh, adherence to the brand values from the franchising. So there is a lot you want, you want from the franchising. But like everything, if I want something from you, I have to give you something back. I can't just expect you know, that you give me everything and I give you nothing. So the, uh, the brand has to give something to the franchising. So what they give them is, if they engage in the overall program, then they get a percentage in the sales. They get uh, coverage in terms of marketing and, and branding. So you need to come up with a, with a plan such that it's win-win for both parties. This is not happening in China at the moment. You know, people are very afraid to touch the franchising because they think most of the business comes from franchising. And um, they don't embrace this enough to understand what needs to, to happen here. But, but we see this picture is changing. Yesterday I said that um, uh, Coach have uh, abandoned their Tmall store and focusing on building WeChat. Uh, so, you know, mobile, <coughs> so that's why we combine the two, the B2C with mobile, because B2C on, on its own would work in the West. But in China, B2C on its own wouldn't work because you need to have the mobile. Mobile is very strong here. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other comments? Um, so I'm giving you a number of examples here just to um, um, you know, uh, communicate the picture better. So this is an example of a roadmap. So you have um, an immediate MMF-based uh, approach. Um, in one to two years, you have an intermediate one, and then you have a long-term one. And then you basically try to create stages. So first, we're going to focus on, on launch, on MMF. Then we're going to go into multi-channel, more customer-centric, more lifestyle, deep engagement, new lines, international, and so on. So you try to take the vision, and you, 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 know, you need to specify the vision to excite people, to make people feel passionate and, and enthusiastic, but you go about it uh, one at a time. So this um, goal of any product, any time, anywhere, which I keep talking about it from a martini perspective, uh, is incredibly important to, to always remember because this is how you drive to um, customer centricity. <clears throat> okay, so, so that was the first part, which is about the vision. And hopefully, um, with the two uh, pie chart examples, uh, that gives you a good picture of uh, what could happen uh, if you don't take that vision into account. Next, let's talk about the actual transformation framework. So, the, uh, you've seen the ASCCI already yesterday, and uh, I'm going to take each one of the uh, five dimensions now and go into a lot more detail. So let's begin with the alignment. As I mentioned yesterday, um, I've been doing multi-channel now for 22 years, and if someone asks me what is the biggest reason for failures, it's usually this. Always the alignment. Missing, you know, having misalignment is always uh, the root of all problems. So, but before we, we get into this, I um, just want to explain a little bit more about um, the action methodology. So, why do we need something like AACCI for transformation? Transformation is a big thing and it takes a long time. And you need to have a method to do transformation that everyone can see and understand and buy into. The method has a beginning and has an end. So along the journey, you need to take checkpoints to see whether you are on the right path. Um, so, and the, the five dimensions are the five challenges facing any organization in terms of transformation. So what we do is we take AACCI dimensions and apply it to each department. We look at marketing 
and we look at um, the department to see, okay, marketing, are you, do you have alignment? Are you agile? Are you customer centric? Are you collaborating? Are you innovative? And we do the same with merchandising, with supply chain, and so on and so forth. So it acts as a compass to show you which direction, what, where you need to pay attention for. So for example, if you have the five dimensions here, and you take each department, and you have a number of criteria that measures alignment, agility, customer centricity, collaboration, and innovation. If you, if you score a perfect score, you will create um, a, a pentagon, because you, know, you will be on each of these points. But if you score badly, say, in the agility, then you will see, you, you will see immediately where you're lacking. So it helps to, uh, to almost give you kind of a checklist in terms of which areas you need to focus on, which areas you need to strengthen. You can immediately see your strengths and weaknesses based on that diagram. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned yesterday, when you are working in a single channel, alignment can be a problem, but it's not disastrous. But when you have multi-channels, then alignment can be a massive problem because, um, you know, that is always the first thing that, uh, that fails and, and you need to fix. And the more channels you have with no alignment, the worse your situation is, gonna, is going to be. The more inefficient, the more costly, the more frustrating for the customer, and, and, and so on. It, it really escalates from there. So that's why we do alignment. Agility, you've seen the picture of multiplicity, remember? You have five ways to expand your business, category, Channels, business models, regions, and segments. Agility means you have the freedom to expand in any of these areas at will. You're not crippled when you want to launch a new country. You're not crippled if you want to expand your segment. So that's why agility is important. Customer centricity, obviously, well, the whole thing is about customer centricity. So we need to make sure that any decisions are being made are being made with the best interests of the customers. Collaboration, I talked about thinking horizontal, not vertical. So we talked about five skills in collaboration yesterday that promote teamwork. Do you remember the five competencies? Communication, Communication is one. Decision making, problem solving. Yep. Very good. You pass. <laughs> so, uh, so these are the soft skills needed uh, within the organization. That's why HR is an important role to play here. And uh, because they, they, they need to uh, support people in terms of how to learn these things. You know, people are not born natural communicators or natural problem solvers. So these are skills you can learn. Uh, innovation obviously is enabler as, as we've seen, so it's quite key. So let's begin with alignment. So what do we mean by alignment? Alignment is based on vision, branding, values, capabilities and KPIs. That's what we mean about alignment within the organization. Vision, do we agree to where we're going as a business? Are we focusing on financial only or are we focusing on financial and branding? as an example. That's immediately you start to see differences within the organization. Branding, you ask a question, what does a brand stand for? <clears throat> you know those five brand values I just talked about, design, community, culture, quality, integrity. You know, now people just say it. You know, they just memorize it, they just know it. They live it and breathe it. Prior to that brand repositioning, mm -hmm. you know, almost every, everyone had interpretation of what the brand mm -hmm. actually means, what the brand represents. The values of the organization, how do you take those brand values and map it to the organization? How do you map it to marketing, merchandise, supply chain? What kind of capabilities you need to have by department to ensure that you are moving in the, in the right direction? Capabilities apply to departments, KPIs apply to individuals. So, let's look at capabilities. So these are our five departments. Let's take marketing. So what are the capabilities for the marketing department? Well, it's broken down into areas. Brand, for example, is about awareness. 
building awareness, building trust. Offline marketing is about what you do in visual merchandise, in catalog, print, etc. So that's how you go about identifying capabilities for each department. KPIs must be done on an individual basis. So you're talking about something really specific. So we talk about smart goal setting. How many of you know smart goal setting? Yeah, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So KPIs need to be written in such a way. So for example, if you look at marketing, again, so you have unique visits um, you know, over time. That's a very specific, there is nothing subjective about this. It's a very objective uh, KPI. And uh, you know, return frequency and so on and so forth. So each department will need to have a very clear set of KPIs. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so this is an area, unfortunately, m most of the organizations we engage with don't pay enough attention to this area. This is organization impact, to try to suss out what will be the impact of transformation of the organization. And without having that clarity in terms of the capabilities and the KPIs <clears throat> and the alignment on the vision and the branding, um, you don't really stand a chance to, to succeed because you know, you'll start to pull in different directions. Talking about agility, these are the five key things from an agility perspective. We begin with data. We are talking about a data-driven culture. I take my financial goal and then I break it down by department. What is the marketing portion of this? What is the merchandise? What's the IT budget? You know, and so on. And then I break it down by category. So in the fashion business, to reach, say, 100 million RMB target, how much of that revenue can I get from dresses, from uh, trousers, from uh, accessories, etc.? Then broken down by month, you know, month by month in terms of the trading. They're not all going to happen in equal terms. Once you have that ability to cascade from one level to the other, then you can start to talk about data-driven culture to actually monitor week by week your trading and try to understand where you need to put emphasis. Um, responsive merchandising is we do not wait for the customer to tell us what they want. We, we, always, we almost try to preempt by building enough knowledge about the customer. So responsiveness is important when we do merchandising, just as um, relationship is important when you build marketing activities because it's about a dialogue, it's not about talking down to customers. It's about building relationships. Um, I talked about uh, the importance of rich in information, rich content in the previous uh, part. And hopefully you, you have now a pretty good picture of what that means. And then finally, Commercial excellence means ability to diversify easily across that multiplicity diagram I showed you, across categories, channels, business models, etc. That's agility in the new world, in a customer-centric world. So the example here is, um, you know, part uh, three, the innovation talked a lot about the problem with bad data and, you know, and, and, and all the effort we've done. And uh, Tasco have seen the advantage for what we've created. And they have adopted it, both in the UK and all the countries that Tesco operate in worldwide, 10 countries. They do use the approach that uh, I just talked about. And that's how they can grow easily from one, one area to the other. Because they are using their business knowledge to create a structure of the content based on unstructured and bad quality data. Moving to um, customer centricity. Any questions so far, by the way? Moving to customer centricity and the key areas for us here. So you've seen this structure already. I introduced this yesterday when I talked about the customer relationship management life cycle. You begin by building customer insight and segmentation, grouping, profiling. You then talk about lifestyle and we talked about the difference between product retailing and lifestyle retailing. Yeah, do you remember that? 
what were the key things I mentioned in terms of lifestyle retailing. This is good revision for you for the exam. Consistency uh, in terms of lives, yeah, consistency in terms of the brand, correct. But if you are going from selling your products to selling lifestyle, what are the key things that you need to be thinking about in addition to consistency of the brand values? Alliances? Yeah, building alliances with other categories, with other vendors, with other merchants. And the other point is about content. Remember the example I talked about in terms of building content to help people to style better, to help people to understand more about the information you know, they're dealing with and so on. Um, customer journey, customer experience. In successful organizations, you have a whole team. They are only worried about the customer journey. What does the customer journey mean? From the point of interacting with us to the point of sharing their stories, all of those 12 steps we need to care about, we need to think about, and whether they are optimum and done to the best of, of our abilities. Personalization is, um, is obviously quite key in terms of differentiation, but to achieve personalization, what do you need to do first? Someone said data, correct answer. You need data before you can do personalization. You need to understand how customers are behaving. And hence, if you don't have the insight in the first place to capture the information, then how can you do personalization? And then finally, uh, reward. How do you reward the customers? This is customer centricity. Target segment is driving directly or indirectly everything in the business. Based on the target segment, we think about the range, we think about the pricing, we think about the roadmap. And indirectly, that would drive the fulfillment, that would drive the social marketing, and the whole thing would drive organization impact. So this is how you do customer centricity, is to think about how your customers are actually driving all these decisions for you. This is a different way of looking at life. You know, we're all too busy thinking in a very inward way. We're thinking about our own departments. We think about our own teams. We don't think enough about the outside world and how customers see us and how they interact with us. Collaboration, um, the five soft skills we talked about, change, communication, effective meetings, problem solving, and decision making. Change. People always react to change. If you ask anyone to change the way they work, they will always react. The thing is, that reaction can sometimes be like this, sometimes can be like this. So it depends on the person about their ability to change. There is always nervousness, always people feel scared to change because they are stepping outside their comfort zone and they are scared to fail. And or, or they just you know, don't want to have the, uh, the burden of learning new skills and, and doing new things. So there is always a lot of doubt in any transformation. People will say, oh, this would never work. Oh, this is China, this is not Britain. This, this is ne never going to work here, you know, because Chinese were different in terms of how we do things. So there's always excuses why this wouldn't work. Because people are, um, it's not just they don't believe in transformation, they're trying to protect their jobs. So that's always a challenge uh, in terms of helping people to cope with change. Communication cannot emphasize the importance of communication. One thing we mentioned here is racy. Uh, that's, that's an important uh, concept. I, lo I lost my board, so um, I will just explain it. Racy, R-A-C-I, stands for R is responsible, A is accountable, C is consult, I is informed. So R is responsible, the person who is responsible for doing the day-to-day -day job. They are the operational person executing the task. A is accountable, the person overseeing 
uh, you know, the person whose head would roll if it fails. So this is the ultimate person responsible, the accountable. C is someone who, who needs to be consulted. So when you do a task and you want to say, okay, actually, I need to consult this person. That's where you specify consult. I is informed of what's happening. So RACI, R-A-C-I. So based on RACI, what is the CO? Which one do you give to the CEO? <coughs> CEO, sorry? A, A, accountable. I. I is correct. If, if, if the CEO is doing the um, actual responsibility the day to day, or the CEO is accountable, obviously the CEO is accountable for the whole thing, that's true. But in terms of execution of the project, just need to be informed, you know. Yeah, we are on track. No, we're not on track. Yes, we're going to hit the target. No, the CEO just needs to be informed. And then people escalate uh, if decision needs to be made. So that's racy. And, um, you know, in, in one case, one of the clients we had in China, every time I go into a meeting, expect to see two people, I see 20. And I, and I just, you know, over time, I just couldn't understand why do they have so many people? And then I realized the reason they have so many people because no one wants to take accountability. So they say, right, if it fails, all of us were there, so it's not, nothing to do with me. And that lack of accountability is costing the organization. Imagine, you know, 20 people on a two hours meeting, that's 40 hours. That's one week worth, worth of work, um, you know, for one meeting. And if you don't have that racy defined, then you'll have that kind of problem. Um, if, which, which obviously talks about effective meetings. You know, how do you perform proper effective meetings? I've been in many meetings where, uh, you know, everyone is sitting and the chairman is, um, is, is lecturing everyone and talking about various things and uh, you don't really have clarity in terms of uh, where this meeting is going and what are the next steps. And then problem solving decision making. Um, I started to work with Tesco in 1996. And um, 97, 98, there was a change of leadership at Tesco. And the new CEO of Tesco was driving change in a massive way. One of the things they made is they've identified soft skills like these. They hired a consulting company. And they gave courses and workshops to every person in the organization. From that point onward, whenever you walk into a meeting, all the meetings are being conducted in exactly the same way. And uh, so... Obviously, the intention is not to create robots, but the intention is to have alignment, have standards in terms of how people are operating, to maximize uh, the process and, and, and achievement. In a multi-channel world, the key word here is iteration. It is not waterfall. So that's why I talked about cogs in a wheel. And uh, this is when I talked about uh, roles, uh, responsive merchandise, ownership, um, customer service, agile supply chain, relationship marketing, and, and S support for IT. And each one of these departments has a number of um, key processes and they're all interacting with each other. So you have this whole interaction happening. And this is normal. This is how real life is. And that's what you need to change paradigm to actually deal with that kind of collaboration. Finally, innovation, we can see innovation being played out in, in all the other uh, areas. So you can use innovation to achieve alignment, agility, customer centricity, collaboration, and introduce innovation in the stores, um, you know, maximize the mobile interaction and so on. So that's how innovation is being played. This is the picture of uh, kiosks and the screen. To, uh, uh, this is an example of the kind of in-store technology that is getting more and more popular. And these are examples where you can employ, where you can deploy uh, technologies and innovation to help you achieve alignment by having some sort of KPI dashboards. So you can track how many orders have we received, how many complaints have we received, how quickly have we answered these queries. How much money we're generating? All of those KPIs are on, on big dashboard screens everyone can see and everyone can understand how, this, how, the, how we're performing. In terms of agility, the ability to provide um, 
a system that allows you to, uh, to trade across the five levers I talked about, channels, categories, etc., is an example of uh, agility. Collaboration is uh, to introduce collaboration portal, you know, like knowledge base, like SharePoint or, or any other kind of systems. Customer centricity is all about CRM, introducing a CRM system that you're able to, uh, you know, manage the whole life cycle of customers and then introduce in-store innovation. 